Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, wherever you're dialing in from or you're joining. It's indeed my pleasure on behalf of the Global Center on Adaptation, the GCA, to welcome everyone to this webinar on water in the State and Trends in Adaptation 2021 report, GCA's flagship report. This webinar is organized by the GCA's Water Adaptation Community, where GCA is building a community of practitioners, decision and policy makers around global and climate change adaptation. This is a platform where you are welcome to join. My name is Anthony Nguyen, and I am the director for Africa at the GCA, and I have the pleasure to be your host today. The purpose of this webinar is to share the technical content on the states and trends on adaptation reports. Specifically, it looks at the role that water plays in adaptation in Africa. Despite contributing very little to global greenhouse gas emissions, the African continent suffers the effects of climate change to a very disproportionate degree. As a result, increasing temperatures and sea levels, changing precipitation patterns, and more extreme weather threaten socioeconomic development in Africa. Ultimately, less water will be available for household use, industry, and agriculture. By the year 2050, about 500 million to about 3 billion additional people will be living with water stress with serious implications for public health and economic growth. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, climate change could further lower gross domestic product, that's the GDP, by up to 3% by 2050. We must address these challenges with bold actions. And this webinar seeks to look closer at the strategies and points for action. I will share a brief overview of the program. First, we will be here, we will hear the opening remarks from GCS Chief Executive Officer, Professor Dr. Patrick Fekoin. Then we will have a presentation on the report by its co-directors whom I will introduce very shortly. This will be followed by a discussion with some very special guests. And there is an opportunity for the audience to ask questions or contribute to the conversation. Please post your questions and comments in the comment field, and we will endeavor to collect and respond to all questions. We'll have a short presentation also by the AU NEPAD Peter Water Community of Practice. Then for those of you who are watching from West Africa, the video which we'll upload Afterwards, we'll have a French audio option. Now I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Patrick Fekoin, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Center on Adaptation. In this role, Professor Fekoin holds, works closely with Ban Ki-moon, architect of the Paris Agreement, as Earth Secretary General of the United Nations, and as Chairman of the Board of GCN. Professor Fekoin has managed the Global Commission on Adaptation and chaired Global Commission on Adaptation chaired by Ban Ki-moon prior to this role. He was the World Bank Special Representative for Climate Change. Professor Fekoin holds a PhD in Sustainable Development Diplomacy from Wageningen University. He also holds a, an MPA from Harvard University and a master's degree in social and political, and political philosophy from the University of Amsterdam. Professor Fekoin, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tony, for your very generous uh, introduction. And, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, let me also add my voice in welcoming you to this uh, very important uh, water adaptation community webinar today, which indeed will focus on water challenges in Africa. I also would like to express my gratitude to the Netherlands government for supporting this broader work on, on the WAC, so to say. So why Africa? 
And as Tony, as you already alluded to, basically the climate emergency has Africa at the crossroads, right? Because business as usual is a sure fire route to chaos, but adapt to it and Africa will thrive. We've all seen, obviously, the IPCC report last summer. We have learned about the life-threatening temperatures above 41 degrees Celsius that may increase by 140 days in some parts of Africa. We have learned, in essence, about the intensification of the water cycle. I mean, the river floods that will change from one in 100 years event to as frequent as one in 20 years events. These are the hard facts of climate change. But in our view, they do not fully capture the reality Africa faces. Let's go back to 2019. I'm sure we all have fresh in our memories the images of the strongest cyclones recorded in the Southern Hemisphere in Africa, Ida and Kenneth. We've all seen those, the destruction it left in that path. And we're in Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe. The lives and livelihoods lost are part of the reality of Africa. But again, this is not the full story. For us at the Global Center of Adaptation, the GCA, the real story of climate change in Africa is the story of resilience, of responsibility, of solidarity, of in fact opportunities for a safer, greener and more prosperous continent. It is this story, the solutions, the innovations, the hard facts of science and the leadership of local communities, the need for coordinated action and the urgent call for more financing. This is the story we tried to capture last October in the State and Trends on Adaptation Report, Focus on Africa. And it was launched by President Kenyatta uh, in Kenya when we were in Nairobi in, um, in October, just before Glasgow. In essence, this State and Trends Report is it's the first time that a single report brings together all the evidence and adaptation solutions for the continent. The report, if you read the report, it has one simple overarching message, which is investing in climate adaptation. It makes economic sense. Every dollar, euro spent in enhancing resilience and climate adaptation, it deals between two and $24 of or euros of economic benefits. In essence, it's in fact inaction, not action that is expensive as delaying action on climate adaptation will only increase cost. And as I'm sure you know, um, we as a GCA, we have been in the last few years, a very strong advocate at the global arena for mobilizing finance and investments for adaptation. For example, at, in Glasgow last month, Together with the UK COP presidency, we convened a ministerial dialogue on adaptation. And these 30 ministers, or 30 plus ministers, from all regions in the world, they were challenged with the question, have we accelerated bold adaptation action for those living on the front lines or not? Also in Glasgow, now more specifically in Africa, we co-convened the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Summit. I mean, it was the first of its kind Together with President Chisikedi, obviously president of DRC, but also the chairman of the African um, Union, we brought together dozens of leaders from Africa and beyond Africa to drive the so-called Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, Triple AP. The Triple AP is the largest adaptation program in Africa to date. We have co-designed this with the African uh, Development Bank. What is it? It's 25 billion over five years on four pillars, agriculture, infrastructure, youth entrepreneurship, and finance. And cross-cutting is this water agenda. Why is that is so important? Because building water climate resilience, as you all well know, has the potential to be the catalyst for a virtuous cycle of social environmental benefits, create jobs, formalize networks of cooperation, giving voice and agency to local communities. So for us at the GCA, this report, the State and Trends Report last year in um, um, October on Africa was not a one-off event. We will have a second audition on State and Trends on Africa in 2022. And why is that important? Because obviously COP27 hosted by Egypt is the Africa Cup. 
So SDA 2022 will form the, and deepen the analytical basis, which will then in turn inform the further work of the AAAP. And we're very keen to, to do this together with you as our partners and friends of GCA. I also, in closing, want to thank um, two particular individuals for the heavy lifting on STA 21, State and Trans Adaptation 21. One is Professor Jamal Sagir, and the other one is Dr. Eddie Ilias. They were the co-directors of the report. They were the analytical and intellectual um, founding fathers of this report. I'm delighted they're with us here uh, uh, today to basically not only share the lessons of the report, but also explore with you how we can work together going forward. I also want to thank uh, Joop Verhagen and Asa Johansson uh, joining um, here today, leading uh, the water team. And in closing, I want to thank all of you, not only joining this webinar, but working with us on this critical uh, agenda. We need your partnership, we need your support, because I'm strongly convinced adaptation is the defining challenge of our generation. And water, as we're here today, will be at the heart of this. Because let us not forget, the COVID pandemic has been relentless. Its health and economic impacts have been devastating. We've all experiencing this on a daily basis. Only together, though, can we address the triple challenge of COVID, economic recovery, and climate adaptation in 2020. So I'm strongly convinced this is going to be hard, 2022, but hard is not impossible. Thank you very much. And I wish you again a very fruitful discussion today. Back to you, Tony. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Fekoin, for those um, strong words. Like you've rightly said, adaptation is it. And for Africa, climate change is water. I have the pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, of introducing two very eminent persons. When I was asked to introduce them. I felt, what could I say about these guys who've been here and there, done it all. But these are the two co-directors of this seminar report for which we are here to discuss today. First, let me introduce Dr. Ede Iyas, who is a senior advisor to the GCA. Ede has had a very meritorious career spanning 23 years at the World Bank he has served as Regional Director for Sustainable Development and Infrastructure for Africa and Latin America. He served as Global Senior Director for the Social, Urban, Rural, and Resilience Technical Practice and Manager of the China Sustainable Development and Infrastructure Program. During his career, he was responsible for a portfolio of about $80 billion of investments and close to 800 policy and advisory reports. He led a team of over 700 technical experts and more than 1,000 consultants deployed across the entire world. He's a non-resident fellow, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and he's currently working on two books, Disruptive Technologies for Sustainable Development and Knowledge Management and organizational change to be published by Rutledge in the year 2022, just next year. Ede has a PhD in civil, in civil and environmental engineering with a specialization in hydrology and water resources from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So you can see he is very ably qualified to speak on this topic today. I also have the privilege of introducing Professor Jamal Sagi, who is also a senior advisor to the GCA. Professor Sag Jamal Sagi is an economist and expert in an expert in infrastructure, climate change, and international finance, with over 25 years of experience at the World Bank Group. From the year 2010 to 2016, he was director of sustainable development and senior regional advisor at the World Bank. He has held several directorships in Africa in agriculture and rural development, energy and infrastructure, environment, climate change, water, transport, and sustainable development. He's currently a professor of practice 
at the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill University, Montreal, Canada. A distinguished fellow for economics and development at the American University of Beirut and a non-resident senior fellow at the Payne Institute, Colorado School of Mines. He is on the board of several companies and institutions. He has contributed to the delivery of major reports to the UN Secretary General and the international community on energy and climate change. Mrs. Sagi has contributed to over 60 publications, essays, and books, many of them on climate change and water. With this, you will agree with me that we have assembled two of the best to be able to address this very important topic. So you have the floor, Dr. Ede. Thank you so much, Tony, for that kind introduction. And it is a great pleasure to be here in the water adaptation community, making a presentation on the water chapter and the conclusions from the state and trends in adaptation 2021 solely focus on Africa. Today, we're gonna to be looking particularly at some of the most important findings and characteristics of uh, what we saw in the report, beginning with a description of what are the current and projected climate risk in Africa, particularly from the water point of view. Uh, then we will look at the most important uh, and critical sector, we believe, from the water perspective, which is agriculture. Um, then we will talk about floods in Africa. And then finally, we will try to bring it all together with an important message. It is time for integrated solutions. It is time to bring different disciplines that have worked in parallel on these topics into one coordinated vision. So the state and trends in adaptation in Africa is, is the second report in this series. The first report was global. We covered uh, every region of the world. For the second version, we decided to focus uh, specifically on Africa. It is a continent that is uh, most vulnerable from many uh, different dimensions. And it's one where there is a lot of uh, potential for adaptation solutions, and we wanted to focus on that. Uh, Science-based, we brought a lot of the best science into the report, uh, a lot of policy analysis and policy recommendations for decision makers, and very, very focused on solutions, as I said before. Uh, we, we tried in the report to cover many dimensions of uh, uh, socioeconomic issues that are related to climate adaptation, all the way from macroeconomics and finance to uh, the COVID recovery and, uh, and what is the role of adaptation measures, uh, private sector, youth and employment, uh, and a variety of economic sectors, from agriculture to uh, transport and infrastructure, to cities, to water resources, as well as the really important topic of drylands and the issues of trade uh, for food security. Finally, some cross-calling themes uh, on health and gender, conflict and migration, and SDGs. But let's get uh, into uh, what do we see as some of the most important um, current uh, risks, climate risk in Africa and the projections. Um, we are very lucky to, to have the IPCC 2020 report, the six assessment report uh, coming before that, because it really uh, was a lightning rod. It was a warning that the situation uh, is serious and it's going to get even more serious. So under all the scenarios that IPCC was looking, uh, basically in the next decade, we could be seeing 1.5 degrees uh, warming and, and by mid-century to uh, degree warming or more. Uh, what uh, is important to note is that these are global averages. And therefore, for continental Africa, the increase in temperature can be much, much higher. Uh, so, for example, the days above 35 degrees centigrade uh, will increase uh, between 20 and 160, depending on the scenario in the region. But when you look even at, at temperatures that, that are really above 40 degrees, when the body is not able to function well and where there's going to be tremendous impacts on health, on labor productivity, on uh, thing, economic sectors like tourism, then these numbers are going to, uh, projected to increase between 10 and 140 days, depending on the scenario in the region from the IPCC. So temperature 
uh, is going to be an important factor looking forward. And in terms of precipitation, floods, and droughts, what is uh, critical is that the, the frequency and, and the intensity of, of the uh, heavy precipitation is projected to increase. So uh, what we see today is one in a hundred year flood. Uh, on low warming scenarios, it can become one in 40 uh, by, by uh, 2050, or uh, it can be one in 20. So these are important changes. And what is really interesting and a message that we want to give uh, out of this report is that it's not floods or droughts. It is actually floods and droughts. And therefore droughts are projected to increase in all regions except the northern parts of East Africa and, and the Horn of Africa. And, and when you look at the changes in total precipitation, uh, they are a small but what you're having is more rain in, in heavy rainfall events in most regions and, and, the, and with the increasing of the evaporative demand, then this is gonna become a far more intense uh, hydrometeorological system to work with. Um, the, that uh, fact that, that the changes in total precipitation may not be big also leads to potential solutions that uh, really focus on storage and nature-based solutions. On coastal flooding, uh, the IPCC is saying, look, the African sea levels are, are rising a little bit faster than global average and will continue to rise. Uh, and the low warming scenarios by the end of the century, between 40 and 50 centimeters, but on the high warming scenarios, close to a meter. And, and what is really critical there is not only how that affects uh, coastal communities and infrastructure, but actually it is the combination of sea level rise and higher uh, intensity uh, precipitation that makes uh, the coastal flooding a very serious problem, meaning a current one in a hundred year uh, flooding event will become one in 10 or 20 years by 2050, and basically one in five or even annually by 2100, even under moderate warming. Now, this means that uh, a lot of the coastal uh, areas of Africa and a lot of the populations that live there are going to be living under much higher risk scenarios. And, uh, uh, and what you see also in the urban chapter, we're not going to go into the urban chapter today, but what you see in the urban chapter of the report is that there is a much rapid migration to these areas and therefore you have a compound issue of urbanization with uh, coastal flooding that is going to make these issues a lot more complicated. Uh, and now let's uh, look into uh, agriculture. So Jamal is gonna take the next few slides. Uh, thank you, Jamal. Uh, many thanks, Eddie. Uh, you have put nicely the framework of the discussion we had in the report. Before I zoom into the agriculture in Africa in particular, let me already give a preview on what does it mean water adaptation. Water adaptation contribute to building resilience to the shocks and disturbance manifested through water quantity and quality variability. I can see five dimensions of water adaptation. Flood prevention, as you already talked about it, and we're going to discuss later on more. Mitigation and protection. Response, recovery from more frequent and intensive flood events in urban and rural area due to the precipitation changes. Erosion protection in coastal area due to sea level increase and river basin due to change in the hydrological dynamic and the water cycles. Reliable water supply capability, climate proof irrigation, water supply, wastewater service and irrigation, and water for ecosystem that in turn provide ecosystem service for natural and human being. These five dimensions enable countries to design their infrastructure and policy incorporating future climate scenario, intending more frequent flood or water stress in all sectors would be affected as we go. In the, what, in the agriculture sector in particular, if you look at that sector, food and nutrition security in Africa is simply off track. We already in the 80s and the 70s missed the Green Revolution. We are almost missing again the resilience of the sector right now it is off track in 2020 more than one five people in africa faced hunger and more than double the proportion of hungry people in any region climate change is already stalling progress toward food security in africa interacting with multiple other stress and shocks including inequality conflict migration economic recession and COVID 19 pandemic this is all putting us to the there. 
if with the three centuries, centuries the trajectory climate, it will reduce their income of the poorest by 40%, by more than 8% by 2030. By 2050, an increase in undernourished people from 282 million people to 350 million people. It reduced 30% of the current growing area of maize and banana and 60% of beans by 2050. It could cause also one fifth loss in West Africa maritime fishery, half of the fishery related job and around 300 million annually in income across food system by 2050. This is what our report was able to find. Next slide, please. Now, if we go with a 1.5 Celsius trajectory, as Eddie was saying at the beginning, it provides more option for adaptation to African food system, but still demand regional and national and local action. We cannot continue business as usual. It has to be much more because the food insecurity continue to increase by five to 20% with each flood or drought. Even you go with the 1.5 trajectory, every time we're gonna have a shock, we're gonna have an impact on food security, on the agriculture and on the poor of Africa. Next slide. If we look now at the nexus between Africa, climate change, agriculture and water, and later on, we can also add especially the issue of energy, but these are the main areas we're discussing today. By 2050, the number of people who lack sufficient water for at least one month per year will soar to more than 5 billion from 3.6 billion today, causing unprecedented competition for water. This competition will turn into conflict, migration, tearing the already fabric of the society, especially in those poorest countries in Africa. We've seen already tension around the lack Chad, we've seen it in East Africa, we see it in the Central Africa, and we see as we go on, as the water stress will increase, we're gonna see more of this. Furthermore, some countries will continue to be further stressed by a heavy dependency on river basin control by upstream nation with unresolved water sharing issue. We hear always about the issue of Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt over the Blue Nile, or other countries we've seen it in the world like Turkey, and that this kind of tension are going inter-region, intra-region, intra-country. And we need to watch them carefully because they will have an impact on agriculture and the people. Growing evidence of ongoing meteorological and hydrological change as well as projection of substantial increase of such changes shortly rendered the urgency of adaptation into water management and questionable. Next slide, please. Since agriculture account for the highest percentage of total water withdrawal in Africa, up to 81%, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the rainfall agriculture account for 95% of the region. More than 1.1 billion people are at risk due to water constraint. This is the sector which creates jobs. This is sector where rural development is happening. And if we don't invest and we don't make it invest in those on efficient irrigation system, in agribusiness and, and specific seed adapted to uh, climate change, we might lose another opportunity to see the continent developing aggressively. Only 3% of the copland in Sub-Saharan Africa is irrigated, 3%. This is less than Mexico, which has 5% of the copland irrigated land. So imagine when we compare a continent with a country, one is 5% irrigated land and one is only 3%. Irrigation infrastructure could be expanded up to 30 India, 8 million hectare compared to this current 7 million. And therefore, it's very important that we are moving to much more aggressive irrigation infrastructure, but it has to be capturing the issue of adaptation as well. Next slide, please. Now, when we look in terms of what we talk about adaptation, it is very interesting, this slide that gives you the poorly rained versus the fully irrigated, where you see where the importance of agricultural water management along the spectrum of what could be done from drainage to surface water irrigation to groundwater irrigation to water harvesting. But what I want to add to that slide is that water adaptation exists already. We've seen it in water collection, where we've seen expansion of reservoir, pump station, water reuse, household farm treatment, water reclamation, it exists in wastewater collection network, where we lose raw water supply, uh, pump marine outfall, construction of wastewater treatment. In sanitation, 
We are seeing now Africa moving in this direction, composting of bio waste, aerobic digestion of sewage sludge, rain, and we've seen it also in the water harvesting, where we've seen rainwater harvesting from the roof, increasing water availability and efficiency of use. This has to go as much more quicker. It has to be speed up. This has to be leveraged to do much more with the investment that will be put in this sector. This is a crucial for Africa. This is a crucial agriculture sector, especially crucial for climate and crucial for protecting the poor. Eddie, back to you. Thank oh, you. Sorry, there's one more slide. Maybe you can do yeah, it. Yeah, one more slide. Outside. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I can do it. <laughs> no, this, this slide is also important. Basically, we don't have any choice. Adaptation, as uh, our CEO said earlier, is not simply a choice. It's a must. It's not, we don't have any more options here. We need to do it. But financial adaptation to climate change will be more effective than frequent disaster relief. And that's what we want our government to understand, that finance adaptation, put the right down payment now because the effect on the long term will be beneficial for you. If you look at the annual agricultural adaptation cost, which is $15 billion, less than 1% of GDP, the cost of inaction or business as usual could be 12% of GDP. In other words, invest now. It's better than you pay the cost later on. And we look at the research extension, water management infrastructure. If you look at what it means to be done and how the cost of action as proportional to cost of inaction, infrastructure and market access, which is important for rural development, for economic growth, it's around 60%. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, now, now let's talk a little bit about uh, floods in Africa. And, and you, floods in reality are one of the most important uh, shocks uh, from, from climate. 65% uh, of the events and 25% uh, of the deaths uh, in, in, in Africa. But what is really particular and what we, we found uh, really important to highlight in the report is the linkage between floods and droughts. So globally, there is about 1.5 billion people that, are, that live in areas with high flood risk, uh, of which about 132 uh, million are poor, so a little less than 10%. But in sub-Saharan Africa, um, the, in terms of total population, 10% uh, of the global population live with high flood risk uh, in the region, but it is 50% of uh, the poor uh, globally that are living in Africa with high level risk. And this happens not only at the national level, if you go down at the subnational level, the World Bank found looking at district uh, population data and flood risk data and poverty data that the poor people are often overexposed to floods. And you can imagine that in cities is because the poor people living in low-income communities tend to uh, uh, locate in areas of higher flood risk. And in uh, Western Africa, for example, countries with larger rivers and, and delta areas, uh, like Benin, Nigeria, Cameroon, uh, then tend to have poor people that uh, actually live in these areas of higher flood. So overall, 73% of the analyzed population in, in, in Africa live in countries with a positive poor exposure bias to fluvial faults. And therefore, it's not only thinking about floods, it's thinking about that linkage of floods and poverty in the continent. And some policy recommendations that are put forward in the report is that, look, um, first of all, understanding the flood risk is fundamental. And understanding the flood risk is not just the hydrological question of how the floods are going to happen, but who's living there, where are their assets, where are the livelihoods, how can uh, we really, uh, find ways to reduce the risk, and, and especially because uh, the traditional uh, flood uh, structure, flood uh, infrastructure is really expensive. So you cannot build digs or around Africa fast enough to deal with that. You cannot solve the flooding problem uh, only thinking that you can uh, build your way around it. Uh, you really need to find what are more uh, practical, simple, uh, lower cost solutions to deal with that. And, and therefore, better planning and preparedness, being ready for when the flood happens so that you can protect your assets, you can protect your lives is a step number one. And step number two is also land use planning and management. How do you make sure that when the populations come and grow in cities, they don't locate in high risk areas? How do you make sure that in rural communities, they don't locate necessarily in areas of highest flood? 
how do you make sure that land um, titles and land insecurity do not force people to go into higher risk areas that then go into these poverty traps that are um, caused by floods and caused by climate change. Now, um, nature-based solutions and the great opportunity that Africa has is that it still has a lot of nature is to uh, how do you protect strategically certain areas of nature, either coastal mangroves, uh, 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 the, the, the nature around uh, rivers and creeks so that uh, nature can serve as a buffer to help the populations reduce the risk that they face in terms of floods. And finally, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that later in the presentation, is the flood risk management sometimes need to look at larger scale, not just the river basin, but sometimes the whole uh, transboundary waters in this process. Another important message that we wanted to highlight in the report is that um, in, in not only in Africa, actually, many countries around the world, the problem is that these the three agendas of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the DRM, the Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sendai Framework, and the Climate Change Adaptation and the UNFCCC, uh, sometimes run in parallel with different institutional arrangements that they don't necessarily talk to each other, but reducing the vulnerability and enhances the resilience of nations, of cities, of communities, really need to have those three areas in a combined way. And, and, and we see in the report, and we did analysis of how um, specific uh, climate shocks uh, take uh, the regions uh, back years in terms of the progress of SDGs. Uh, how sometimes thinking about the DRM only focuses on the disasters of today and the building back better doesn't always necessarily look at what may be happening with the climate looking forward. So bringing all of these things together is particularly important uh, for Africa as it moves forward. And this becomes critical in two disciplines for the water sector. One is disaster risk management that's really trying to push a lot of the, the search, uh, the, the, the continuous management, the building back better, the public information systems, the early warning systems, continuously planning. And on the other side of the spectrum, something that has been talked for many years, which is the integrated water resources management, how to look at land and water use, special planning infrastructure. So these two disciplines need to start connecting and bringing together so that they're not running in parallel. They can leverage each other. They can really bring much better benefits to the region. I'll conclude with one important point, and that is transboundary waters, because 90% of the uh, Africa's surface water is in transboundary basin. So uh, if you're looking at climate adaptation only within the nation, then you may be limiting your solutions, and therefore regional cooperation all the way from practical things like simple data sharing so that the understanding of, uh, of the climate change and the risks of floods and droughts can be better understood by the nations that are sharing the data, all the way to joint implementation of large uh, transponder infrastructure projects, multi-purpose dams, you name. And, 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 and lessons uh, of how to bring together this uh, transboundary cooperation and climate adaptation from a few excellent examples that uh, are taken in Africa is that, look, in the end, sharing information that is trusted by all parties help all of these parties uh, get their prepared for the more frequent and more intense uh, shock from climate. Uh, if and, and if you move to the next step, which is to sharing planning tools, then uh, all the preparing us working together can optimize what are some of the practical measures to take into climate adaptation. Uh, how do you share infrastructure, not only from the gray infrastructure, from multipurpose land, but also on the uh, green infrastructure, watershed management and reforestation, that can help the entire basin be more resilient and be better adapted to climate change. And in Africa, uh, it, given the, the challenges in terms of technical capacity, cooperation to make sure that that technical capacity can be shared and leveraged, and countries can come to the international community and with better plans to mobilize more financial resources, uh, is a critical dimension of uh, of transboundary waters that is so particular to a region like Africa uh, in ways that very few other regions in the world have to tackle that, uh, maybe Central Asia uh, as an example. So let me pass it on back to Jamal for a few um, conclusions from the uh, report in the area of water. Jamal, back to you. Many, thing, uh, many thanks, uh, Eddie, for providing us the deep framework and at the same time providing us the lesson learned from transboundary cooperation climate adaptation. In conclusion, 
What we believe in this report, we made it very clear, is that priority action for African government to enable adaptation, water management, and food system encompasses both policy intervention and public financial investment. It's not about sequencing anymore. It's what you have to go in parallel if you want to speed up and be able to adapt. For the policy intervention, the financial costs are relatively low, but the political effort and political will at the national, local, municipal, and regional level is essential and needed. IWRM, DRR, and climate adaptation need common approaches. This report made it very clear. Those three practices cannot continue to going in parallel, developing their own toolkit, developing their own strategy. And we've seen it too many of them, and they are sometimes complementary, but sometimes they are contradictory. It's time to look at common approaches, to look at the same angle. And actually, like one of the questions that was asked, and I tried to respond quickly, we need also some prerequisite to be done on the water supply, all the issue of reform and accounted for water, water pricing, all of this, the toolkit that we used to do in the 90s to 2000, this has to continue. What we are adding here in this report is that while we do the basic, we need to adapt and move to the next level quickly so that we don't lose opportunity what we have done at the basic. There is sound evidence based from which to build a business case for climate finance and private finance. There's a lot of interest in funding adaptation solution because they bring innovation, they bring technology, they bring know-how. There is substantial practice experience to draw on implementation from, from Africa and globally. South-South is moving very quickly. North-South is important. And also I've seen a lot of regional uh, experience that could be also going within the countries within the local side. So five key areas of investment, research and extension of the service. This is important, water management, Climate resilient infrastructure has to become part of the business, sustainable land management, and climate information service and data, which will allow us to be looking at the future in a much more brighter world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ede and Jamal. That was really, really very thought provoking. And we have seen several questions already come in. So please, if you've not posted your question or if it has not been responded to, please do so and um, we will take you on. But in the meantime, let me invite Yup. Yup uh, Ferahen is the GCA lead on water. What is your take on this? Because this is a very comprehensive report. How is this influencing what you are doing at the Global Center on Adaptation? Yup. Yeah, thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much, Ada and Jamal, for this very comprehensive and excellent presentation. What, what we take away is that, for us, water is at the heart of climate change adaptation. But as the presentation shows, water is also at the heart of the SDGs, and the world is not on track to achieve the SDGs related to water. Climate change is further compounding our challenge to deal with this, with this. What is needed is a massive investment. And it's very clear that we are not putting enough money into water adaptation. We are not putting enough money in attaining the water SDGs. Apart from the finance, and Jamal was alluding to it, what is needed is an integrated approach. Water adaptation needs to be mainstreamed at the national level. We cannot deal with water for people, water for the economy, or water for nature, and water for food separately. We need to bring these policies together. We cannot talk about droughts without thinking about floods. What Jamal and the presentation clearly made clear, Disaster risk reduction, integrated water resource management, climate adaptation need to be brought together in one policy. Um, what is needed to track this improved and more integrated policies will also help countries to attract investments into the water sector. Improved governance, improved water governance is essential as well. It's cheap, it's, it costs less, but it's hard and it will require a political will and massive support from all of us. 
many countries in Africa are making steps. There are countries moving and trying to make together, we bring together DRR and integrated water resource management. There are efforts to better manage water across boundaries, but we need to move faster and we need to move better to really meet the challenge of adapting uh, to a different climate and making sure that we are having a, a more resilient world tomorrow. What we do at GCA, to give you an example, one of the things that we do, we have the City Adaptation Accelerator, where we help cities to mainstream water in their effort to build resilient cities for the future. We help cities to understand climate risks. We support together with them, we, together with them, we strategize, prioritize and plan for resilience building. We build the capacities and together with key institutions such as the AFE to be in the World Bank, we make sure that the plans actually get financed on the grounds so that cities are become more resilient, more sustainable for all. Tony, I'll leave it there because there are many questions and there are many people who want to contribute. But thanks again for this uh, opportunity to speak. Okay, thank you so very much, Yup. This report, as we can see, has very practical learning. That it's not just a report on the shelf, it's really informing the way in which we uh, deliver at the GCA. And I'm also very certain the way that others are going to be delivering this. Let me also, uh, somebody raised an issue that we have not dealt so extensively with the frequency of cyclones that we're going to be having. At the beginning, the CEO, Professor Fekoin, mentioned the two biggest cyclones that we've received in Southern Africa, Hurricane Idai and Hurricane Kenneth. Are more of those expected? What should we be thinking about? So that's a question to you, Ede and uh, Jamal. I don't know which of you would want to take that up. Eddie, go ahead. So Tony, what the report says, and actually what the report says and what the IPCC report also, the, the projections indicate potential frequency, but greater intensity of those cyclones and the tremendous damage that they can cause. Measures that we mentioned on uh, disaster management are particularly important for cyclones, uh, one of the most visible disasters altogether. But let's remember that there are thousands of disasters at the local level in Africa that make the news of cyclones and are equally destructive of lives and livelihoods throughout the continent. Back to you, Tony. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Asse, this question comes to you. You basically coordinate the water adaptation communities. And this is a series of seminars you will be leading. Why water? And what are you seeing thus far in the communities of practice that you are already leading? Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, well, talking as a facilitator for the water adaptation community, I think that water um, is, has always been hidden in a way from the uh, agenda because we take it for granted. So we, what, and also what the water we don't see that runs through the plants and is in the atmosphere. So I think it's very important to stress all the different aspects of water, not just the, the water we see as, as water supply in, in, the, in the tap and so on, but water is everywhere, it's used for everything. So it, it really demands, I think what's important in relation to the communities, um, uh, the walk uh, is to really the importance of collaboration. So I think understanding each other's views and having um, being able to share perceptions uh, in a safe space, your experience, your knowledge, and to be um, to learn from each other to really put each other uh, put us as ourselves in each other's shoes and to um, maybe learn together and move forward from there. So uh, it's not only about sitting around in the same room and, and, and talking, we really have to get into the conversation and really that raise some critical questions and, and really move forward together. So look for answers together and 
to to see how can we change um, the governance, the financial mechanisms, the organizational um, structures to sub to the policies. These things are not easy questions, but really demands that we sit together. So I think um, we really need, for the water's sake, we really need to find ways of, of collaborating and learning better together. So, so this is what we try to promote in the water adaptation communities and, and try to understand, uh, yeah, bring the in different stakeholders and views in there to, to have a conversation. So you're all welcome. Thank you. Now let me let me add something here, maybe Tony, if you allow me to ask. First of all, water for adaptation in the West renewable energy is for mitigation. If you compare these two aspects, the renewable energy has been doing a breakthrough in terms of technology, in terms of moving in low carbon, in terms of substituting fossil fuel. The water sector for adaptation has to go through much more aggressive technology breakthrough, much more uh prevention side much more reform and to be more attractive also for investment from the private sector this sector has never been really attracted by the private sector late of return of any investment of utility was always less than 12 percent where energy was around 20 percent but telecom 25 percent we need to put that sector as as you put it at the middle of the adaptation story because if we miss it the impact it will have on irrigation agriculture and food security and environmental visibility on anything else will be huge. And therefore, the importance of this water practice to put now the emphasis and move from the traditional water issue of a human right, which are important, but they have been repeated too many times, physical water reform, corporatization, transboundary issue, or groundwater management to make it much more integrated and make it the adaptation at the game in town in the next five to 10 years. Thank you very much, Jamal, because you've just raised a very important issue. Why do we look at water as a resource, as a social service that must be provided to everyone? That's the angle at which we're coming in. So I think that drives down investments in that sector. What typically being around this, you've led major initiatives on this, uh, Jamal. What one key recommendation can you make that will allow government, uh, particularly our government in Africa, to realize that water as a resource, you know, could attract investors and investments, or on the other hand, if it's not properly harnessed and channeled, could also lead to a very, a significant drop in all economic indices. What we need to convince, we need to convince Minister of Finance of Africa that investing in water is a good thing and has an impact on economic growth and job creation and poverty reduction. This battle we have been carrying out for the last 20 years, we have not yet succeeded to give any Minister of Water or Climate Water a good seat on the table and council of medicine. Only a few countries listen carefully to what Minister of Water will tell them in terms of economic return of good investment in water in the past. And now with adaptation, the message is, it's good to invest in water because it could have a long-term impact on economic growth, especially in terms of investment in the food security business. That message is not yet completely understood. And our colleague later on, probably from the uh, different practices from the water governance, Dr. Alex Simbalawa, we probably will confirm that from his experience at the NEPAD. So the water sector has to become a focus of attention of Minister of Finance. That's my priority here. And if we get there, we'll be able to move the agenda much more aggressively than we have seen in the past. And therefore adaptation is a good entry point there is a cost right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce a very dear colleague of mine, Mr. Alex Simalabri, who is the Executive Secretary of the Global Water Partnership, Southern Africa, and Head of the Global Water Partnership Coordination Unit. He's also the Global Water Partnership's Global Lead 
on climate change and the global coordinator of the water, climate change and development program at the Global Water Partnership headquarters. He co-chaired the World Bank Expert Group for Climate Resilience and received, developed and conceived, developed and led a program for investments, preparation, water security and climate resilience development across 60 countries spanning four continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Mr. Simalabwi has advised more than 20 countries and governments on the integration of water into economic development. He's a lead author of Water Security for Development in Africa. He led the development of the African Union Strategic Framework for Water Security and Climate Resilient Development. He holds a postgraduate qualification in business, that's a master's in business administration, civil engineering, and a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University's uh, Kennedy School of Government. So, Alex, you are working on another community of practice, but this time it looks at transboundary water governance and international water law. Can you tell us what, what is driving this, why it was set up, and how you believe that this can also create a niche and help address the issues that we've talked about today? So Alex, over to you. You have the floor. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And thank you, GCA, for inviting me and the Global Water Partnership to contribute to this very exciting uh, webinar uh, basically reflecting on the state of trend report. And, uh, I think just to also mention that and agree with my colleague Job, uh, who I'm working very closely with uh, on water in Africa, that indeed water is the center of adaptation. Basically, that's how we see it. And I think we've seen the uh, presentations from the experts, including Jama, how floods and droughts have been making a mess of Africa's hydrology and, of course, uh, extension to Africa's uh, economy as a whole. So the community of trust I'm going to talk about is really part of what called the Africa Water Investment Program, uh, officially the Continental Africa Water Investment Program. Very ambitious program uh, whose goal is to mobilize at least 30 billion by, 20, by, 20, by 2030 uh, and to help to generate 5 million jobs. Uh, so it's a, key, it's a very, very advanced program in terms of its main uh, ambition. And really this program uh, is uh, an official program of the African Union. It was adopted by the AU heads of states in February 2021 this year. Uh, and it was also endorsed uh, by the governing council of the African Minister's Council of Water, AMCO. Um, the Africa Water Investment Program was originally an idea of the United Nations and World Bank High Level Party on Water which was uh, convened by president of the World Bank and UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon, who is actually currently chair of the GCA. So in his final report released in 2018, the, the high level panel recommended for the launch of an Africa water investment program uh, to accelerate the transformation required uh, to mobilize investments for water sanitation uh, in Africa and also address the increasing risk of climate, uh, climate change. Its objective is to simply transform the investment outlook for water security, mobilize high level investments. I think as uh, Professor Jamal has mentioned that are required, like we have seen in other sectors like education, uh, health, uh, energy, uh, which unfortunately has not been the case for Africa. Investments in Africa have been lagging behind. Uh, objective is to promote job creation, putting jobs, economic growth at the center uh, of water management and water investments, uh, with water being a means to an end and not just water uh, uh, management or water supply and sanitation for, people, for, for, for its own sake, but really putting water at the center of economic growth and job creation. So the AIP uh, basically has been conceived and adopted by African Union by heads of states to respond to one problem, to narrow the water investment gap on the continent. According to African Development Bank, the investments required to achieve Africa's vision for water security is about 64 billion per year. 
but actual investments are only between 10 and 19, leaving a significant massive water investment gap, estimated at 45 to 54 billion a year, which is required to be mobilized. So the question is, how do we narrow this investment gap? Because as long as the finance is not flowing, plans and policies can be there, but implementation will always be lagging behind. So the AIP tries to respond to this single problem of trying to mobilize large investments uh, for water management, water and sanitation, uh, environmental management, nature-based solutions, and infrastructure to, to narrow this water investment gap. How is the AIP addressing this? Uh, firstly, it's by mobilizing a high level political commitment. And again, I go back to what Jama has said. Water is too complicated to be left to the bureaucrats like me. It's very complicated at a transboundary level. It's very complicated because Africa shares over 64 river basins. Uh, so you need political discussions at a very high level and the heads of states have to be engaged. There's not going to be any major investments in water. There can never be any big investments on water without the involvement of heads of state. So as a result, the AIP will try and mobilize and is working very actively on this to establish an international high level panel on water investments for Africa, comprised of representative of nominated heads of states from Africa, as well as leaders uh, from the international community with the objective of mobilizing high level political commitment and following up on commitments that are made on mobilizing finance and investments for Africa. And secondly, development of an AI water investment scorecard to track progress in the mobilization of investments and also putting in place mechanisms to mobilize blended finance and leveraging the private sector because the private sector has been a bystander in water for a variety of risks that are involved. So we need to have measures that can de-risk uh, the barriers and the risks that constrain the private sector from investments in water by having a mechanism for establishing blended finance facilities. And of course, strengthening the enabling environment, the business case for water and investment climate at the national level is very, very important, as well as addressing the bottlenecks of project preparation that constrain the preparation of bankable projects, as well as making sure that climate resilience Gender transformation, gender empowerment, social inclusion is at the center of investments in water when they are prepared. So we have mobilized and we're working active with a number of partners towards what one might call a community of practice on water investments in Africa. We, over 23 global and pan-African institutions are working together since May. Uh, you can see some of the organizations that are here, including the Global Center for Adaptation and many others, but over, 20, over 23 partners currently uh, have officially joined the Africa Water Investment Program and are working together in trying to find ways on how to narrow the water investment gap uh, by first of all developing what is called a water investment scorecard. So these 23 organizations chaired by the African Union Development Agency uh, and, and also supported by the African Minister's Council on Water uh, with also leadership and guidance from the African Development Bank, including the World Bank and the OECD, are working actively to develop a tracking tool uh, to support the Continental Africa Water Investment Program. It will be presented to the heads of state on a regular basis to ensure accountability. Uh, it will set benchmarks to assist countries to track progress in understanding the national water investment gap and where action is required. And it will display country level performance against higher level priority uh, thematic indicators that are being developed by the, uh, by the partners and also it's being developed, as I mentioned, to enhance mutual accountability so that when commitments are made, accountability uh, can be followed. It will support the countries of progress, identify bottlenecks and mobilize action uh, to narrow the water investment gap and make a political case at the highest level, heads of states, ministers of water, ministers of finance and heads of state on what needs to be done to mobilize these, uh, these investments, including mobilizing uh, uh, support from the private sector. This is what it looks like. So the th three pillars of the framework has just recently been approved uh, by the steering committee that is leading this work, which is co-chaired by uh, His Excellency Ibrahim Mayaki, uh, former prime minister of Niger and current uh, chief executive officer of the African Union Development Agency, as well as His Excellency uh, Jakaya Kikwete, the former president of Tanzania. They are co-chairing uh, the steering group for the development of the scorecard. And recently they have just approved the three pillars 
of this water investment scorecard. One, enabling environment for water investments, strengthening the enabling environment, very, very important, including improving the investment risks, reducing market risks and the regulatory risks, and ensuring social and gender inclusion and environmental inclusion in, in the design of investments. Secondly, mobilizing accelerated investments from government, public expenditure, from the treasury, from ODA, as well as private sector, and including philanthropic foundations, philanthropic investments. And finally, the third pillar is about enhancing investment performance and sustainability. We don't need white elephants. We have many dams that have been installed, but are not working properly. Many water supply systems that have been installed, but not working properly. Many boreholes that have been drilled, but they dry up. So we need to enhance the performance of water supply, sanitation, and water resources investments by making sure that we are able to follow up in terms of asset maintenance, operational maintenance, enhancing climate resilience, and making sure that the economic impact of water is also tracked, including the risks. So this is what the community of practice is working on, uh, led by the African Union Development Agency. And just to highlight some of the investments being considered, 23 high-level transboundary program on water and energy across Africa. These have already been approved by the heads of states. So the water investment scorecard is gonna be tracking uh, the progress in the development of these large scale, as well as uh, small scale investments, including nature-based solutions and ecosystems. The program has already started. Five countries are working on this. Tunis, Benin, Cameroon, Uganda, Tanzania, and five river basins, Zambezi Basin, Lake Victoria, Lake Chad, and Volta Basin. So I thank you, uh, Professor Tong, yeah, for giving me the opportunity. And just to say thank you very much also to the uh, GCA for the grace that we're doing. And we're looking forward to working very closely with you on the Africa Water Investment Program. And thank you, Job, for your active participation in in the community of practice of the AIP Water Investment Scorecard, where you're actively involved in representing GCA. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. That was really, really very forward-leaning and thought-provoking. They, and it's very comforting to know that there's something happening at that level, because like you've rightly said, if, it's, if there isn't that political support, that leadership, then it becomes a struggle. In September, when we held the Friends, GCF uh, Friends of um, the AAAP and Adaptation, we know that President Kikwete was there and you accompanied him and he really laid out the, his passion, why he believes this is the way to go. And it tallies exactly with what we're doing generally on adaptation, because prior to this time, Hardly would you have resilience or adaptation tech center stage at an event like COP, but global attention is being drawn to it. And I like the fact that global attention is also being drawn to the issues of water as an adaptation necessity for Africa. So let me turn back to you, um, Ede. You've listened to... Uh, You've listened to Alex, you've seen what they are doing. What is your take on this? Thank you, Tony. Uh, and Alex, uh, thank you for that great presentation. I think that uh, the AIP and the initiatives that the Africa Union and are undertaking are fundamental to really uh, improve the management of water in this process. I think that uh, uh, in the end, these solutions are an integral part of strengthening the adaptation and resilience of Africa to climate change. Um, our our uh, recommendations in the book and, and with uh, many of the partners that continue are threefold. First, um, many of the uh, may not always think about how important climate change is going to be in the future. But these structures are going to be there for 20, 50, 70 years, which is exactly the period where a lot of the 
impacts of climate change will happen. And therefore, designing all of these projects, therefore, many of these projects need to start looking at how to work together with nature to and to be resilient agreefully is that the problem cannot be solved without serious transboundary cooperation as you're working on. Hello? Go ahead, Tony. Okay, we lost you, Boris. Okay, so thank you very much for that. A lot of Africa's uh, river basins are shared river basins with potentials for lots of conflicts, like Jamal had mentioned at the beginning. I see this AIP as um, an instrument, a vehicle that could at that level diffuse some of the potential conflicts that might be coming up in the management of shared river basins. Jamal, any thoughts on this? First of all, I, I would like to thank the participant. I have been watching carefully all the Q&A and I'm trying as much as possible to answer. I think one important message that uh, Kamal Jamawi from Algeria is, is putting here in the chat is basically how realistic in your proposal, recommendation, and conclusion to be implemented. In addition, also to the comment, which was uh, why Africa are not being involved. So let me try also to answer publicly this. This report is done with many African. This report reflect Africa. This is not a report written by people. This is people who knows Africa, who work with Africa, who has been many years between the, the co-director you have at least 50 years of Africa. So we are not trying to come with ideas that are not reflected the concept, and especially all the consultants we got from the university, the case studies. So Kamal, it's important that you understand that part because one of the I think it's important for us at GCA is that we want to be hearing the continent and helping the continent deal with it. Then the question about, and that come back to what you're saying, Tony, how realistic is to implement the recommendation conclusion? Actually, we are recommending, we are already working. We are working on in the Sahel, we are working in the Horn of Africa with the Africa Bank and some of the recommendation on the agricultural side in particular about what kind of water adaptation so we are moving and the whole idea is to go from, from the theory to a solution broker. That's what GCA, that's the only organization which is solution broker. The incentive is all about delivery on the ground. However, delivering on the ground is also understanding what's happening in the ground. Therefore, the question that you Tony ask is important for us. If you don't understand the transboundary issues and the political economy related to water or the issue of irrigation, agriculture, nexus, and the issue of uh, food security, we will not be able to advise properly. Then we become like anybody else coming with top-down solution that can be fabricated somewhere. I think what we are trying to do under the leadership of Tony, especially in Africa, who is, who is really in the middle of the continent, is to provide something which is feasible, acceptable. That's why some of the recommendations you will see could be very simple coming from that report. Some of them will require simply political will. Alex was very clear. If we don't get head of state, prime minister, and minister of finance, to take care and be focused on adaptation in water, it's complete loss of time. I think it's time to get this clear in our mind. It's not a technical issue. I was last week in a Tamirar on technical issue on the water for the MENA region. It's very interesting. All the technical bright people of the region are all putting their act together. I haven't heard a political economy or political message that will force change on the attitude of how much funding we will put in the region. So that's an important aspect for you, Tony, that you, as, as we conclude this comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamal. And uh, Alex, thanks once again. 
like you said, most of the things we can do uh, look difficult. But like the CEO said, difficult is not impossible. When we came back from COP21 and everyone has submitted their nationally determined contributions. And basically what I saw at the African level was we need about $3 trillion by 2030 to implement the nationally determined contributions. And that made it look like we are a sunk cost and nothing was happening. I'm with the African Development Bank. But when we change the narrative that there is a market, there is an opportunity worth three trillion dollars by 2030. Because most of those things that would be implemented through the NDCs will not be done by government. Governments will just create the enabling environment and allow those who want to do it to come in. We started seeing people approach us, approach the bank impact investors, they want to be a part of this because of just changing that narrative. So I believe that there are things that can be done, simple things like changing the narrative and seeing that there is good investment opportunities. The state and trends has actually shown the positive cost benefits of investing even in water, investing in agriculture, investing in irrigation, investing in uh, climate information services. So if there is that uh, positive um, cost benefit ratios in favor of resilience, then I think we need to promote it. And I believe we need to push for it because a lot of the private sector operators are not aware. And that's one of the beauties of the state and trend report that it provides information on these benefits that you wouldn't re readily find anywhere else. Um, I think in the absence of um, any other, well, except maybe Jamali have a closing word, then Ede have a closing word, take home, none, Ede, any closing remark, take home. Jamal, you go first? Um, maybe, first of all, I would like to thank you, Tony, thank you, I say for a fantastic uh, really gathering this morning. I would like to thank the Dutch government. I know it's very important for the Dutch government to have this kind of debate, this kind of alternative community. I participate in many meetings and I do hope we are responding to this kind to bring people together from around the continent on different issue and go deep into it. And I do hope we'll have more of this kind of discussion. I hope in the future we're gonna have discussion on subsectors to go deep into, into some deep dive and learn from all your comments and get your advice on how we can do a better job for Africa and for the people of Africa in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eden. Thank you. No, and also uh, thank you, Tony, of course, for the fantastic moderation. And also thanks to the water adaptation community. These platforms for sharing knowledge and for having spaces for continuous discussion that goes beyond the event are really important for the global adaptation community. Uh, we encourage you to take a look at the water chapter and other chapters of state and trends in adaptation. And we look forward to engaging in different ways. Please stay tuned for technical discussions of other chapters that you water and sanitation to find out to deeper engagements with SDGs and the like. So thank you, Tony, so much again for all. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Eddie and Jamal, for the brilliant presentation. We've heard a lot. We've seen the role and the importance that water plays in adaptation and how we ourselves should adapt. Like the CEO normally says, adapt and thrive or stay where you are and die. And we know that we can't afford to do that. We really don't have an option. Water is very important. Water is critical to Africa's economy. And the more we keep looking at it as a, a global public good that is free, then I think it makes it very difficult for us to really appreciate the need to take care and safeguard our water resources. My take home is 
investing in adaptation in the water sector is smart economics. The positive rates of return would encourage the private sector. How can the public sector create the enabling opportunity for that to happen? And I'm glad that the community of practice being put together by the ALDA and the Global Water Partnership will specifically address these issues. And I look forward to seeing a closer collaboration. We've started already working together. There is no need to keep working in silos anymore. Nobody plans in the dark anymore. The state and trends has put things on the table that opportunities that are in one place are brought to the fore and that others could also see if it worked in that community, then it can also work in this other community. I want to specifically thank the CEO for driving this agenda, making it happen. I want to thank the team, particularly Asse, for organizing this webinar. It hasn't been easy bringing in all the people that uh, have tuned into it, you and the entire team. So thank you so very much. And we look forward to having another session very soon. God bless and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Organizing, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Ade. Thank you.